welcome, welcome everyone. And thank you for dialing in tonight to the uh, next episode of the uh, 2023 State of Play series. Uh, for those of you on Zoom, you may see a notification about the meeting being recorded. Just click OK uh, and agree to continue. Um, firstly, an acknowledgement of country. So in the spirit of reconciliation, MND Australia acknowledges the traditional, traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. And I'd like to acknowledge the Wiradjuri people on whose land I am and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend a welcome to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander peoples on this call today. Um, so today's theme is focused on um, uh, uh, new and old treatments and also optimising the, the ones we have. Uh, we're incredibly fortunate to have two really world-leading clinical researchers on the state of play tonight. We have uh, Professor Steve Vucic, a, a neurologist from the University of Sydney and also at the Concord MND Clinic, and Professor David Berlowitz, who's a respiratory physiotherapist, is that exactly, I think, pretty much, at the University of Melbourne and at the Institute for Breathing and Sleep at Austin Health. Um, as previously, uh, as per usual, each presenter will talk for about 20, 25 minutes. Then we'll have a combined Q and A session at the end of the session. Uh, at the end of the session, so uh, please submit your questions through the Q and A or Q and A or the chat function if you're on Zoom, or through the comments if you're watching through Facebook. Um, we'll collate all the questions and I'll feed them through to our um, our presenters at the end. So um, also don't wait to the end to type your questions, uh, just fire them in as we go and I'll collate them as you go. Yeah? Otherwise you might, in case you forget them as I often do. So put them in as soon as you think about them and then uh, we'll ask them at the end. Um, so that's all you need to hear from me for tonight. So please uh, take it away, Steve. Thank you so much. And I'd like to extend my gratitude for being invited tonight. And I'd like to welcome my a colleague and friend David Berlowitz. So let me just share my presentation. Uh, is that coming up okay? Uh, it's just on the slide, not the uh, presentation. That's it. Perfect. Great. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Tonight I want to talk to you about uh, uh, updates on ALS treatments, the old and the new. And there I say this area has been quite uh, uh, active and uh, exciting. To kick off with, uh, ALS or motor neuron disease is a complex neurodegenerative disorder with multiple molecular processes um, uh, operating at both the motor neuron level, but also at a higher level, at the level of the brain. And in particular, uh, one of the areas that our group, my group has been interested in is uh, looking at this relation between the upper and the motor neuron, uh, and in particular, glutamate excitotoxicity which seems to be a very important mechanism in ALS. But there are other mechanisms that are linked uh, and they are varied, it includes excessive oxidative stress, accumulation of various mutant proteins, such as the SOD1 protein, which I'll talk a little bit more in detail, um, various uh, problems with uh, uh, channel uh, uh, receptor functions within the cell and so on. And each of these potentially represents a treatment target, and I'll cover a number of those. Uh, but just to underscore this, ALS is a, a complex uh, a disease. It does, does not seem to have one mechanism, but rather it's a multi-step process um, uh, with five to six steps required in sporadic ALS. This was established both by Amar al Chalabi uh, in 2014 and also by us, both in the Australian slash Caucasian and also Asian populations. Uh, if you inherit a genetic mutation, the number of these steps is reduced. And these uh, steps perhaps vary from person to person, but they probably reflect an interaction between uh, the genes uh, and the environment. Now, what about treatments? I'll start off with an oldie uh, that has been, uh, that was first uh, uh, reported in 1994. That's a drug called Rilazole which I'm sure uh, most of you will be aware of. Uh, this is on the PBS, and it's a uh, medication that uh, inhibits the release of glutamate and thereby antagonizes 
glutamate excitotoxicity uh, from here. So the nerves that project onto the motor neuron uh, are blocked and they don't release this toxic uh, uh, glutamate. And that's the theory by which it uh, apparently uh, works. Now, as you all know, this is not a cure. It slows down disease progression by about 30 to 40%. And uh, um, probably extends life in large epidemiological studies by about three to four months. Uh, now, I'm not gonna focus too much on this, but just to sort of update on, uh, you on a couple of new um, developments. Uh, Amar al Chalabi and his team uh, looked at the efficacy of Rilizol in different stages of ALS, and they established that not only is it effective in early stages, it is also effective in later stages or stage four. Uh, and the 100 milligram dose seems to be uh, the most optimal. We also wondered why Rilizol does not work completely. And so in, in studies that we conducted uh, and published in 2013, we found that Rilizol nor, uh, improves or reduces cortical hyperexcitability, but only partially. So it goes from here to here, and these are here are normal uh, people. Uh, and this partial correction is only transient lasts for a period of three to four months, which is the, the duration of effect of Rilizol. Why this is, we don't know. Um, theories are that it could uh, just simply represent uh, ongoing neurodegeneration, or it could be that the brain develops various pumps that extrude Rilizol. In any event, Rilizol is uh, certainly uh, one of the treatments. It's, it's the only treatment that is available on the PBS, and uh, you definitely should be on it if you have ALS. Now, the other uh, uh, treatment and, uh, that uh, was based around a different mechanism called oxidative stress or endoplasmic uh, reticulum stress is a drug called radicava, or you, you may know it as adaravan. Now, adaravan has been used for strokes, and it, in strokes, it seems to, uh, be, uh, to exhibit limited neuroprotective efficacy. And so... Um, a group of uh, a large group of uh, ALS physicians in Japan investigated Adaron as a possible treatment, and it would act against all of these toxic uh, effects that oxidative stress does on the cell. So they conducted a very focused study looking at Japanese ALS patients who are in the earliest stages of their disease uh, uh, course. Grade one or grade two means that they are independent. Um, within two years of uh, symptom onset, uh, and uh, they um, have a relatively preserved uh, functional score. And what they found was that there was a, at six months, patients that received the Daravan uh, did slightly better in terms of uh, their functional disability. Uh, uh, they, there was a slowing of this functional disability equating to about a 30% uh, reduction in the rate of functional disability progression. So patients continue to progress, but at a slower uh, pace. Uh, and this was also verified when they looked at another score called the Norris scale, which also looks at functional disability. But unfortunately, there was no effect on breathing uh, and there was no effect on muscle strength. But despite this, Adaran was uh, approved by the FDA. And uh, it is certainly a positive uh, trial. Now, this effect was seen above and beyond uh, Rilizol. So the patients received either Rilizol and Adaravan or Rilizol and placebo. Now, this drug is infused uh, for a period of 10 days followed by a 14-day uh, rest period. It takes about an hour to uh, infuse. And it, it has just gotten listed in Australia on the TGA. It's not yet available uh, on the PBS, but the hopes are that that will be available very soon. Now, post-marketing studies have been rather mixed with the Daravan. Um, an American group led by Benjamin Brooks, who was uh, one of the is one of the famous ALS physicians who came up with one of the diagnostic criteria called the Oscorial, found that uh, even in patients who had poor respiratory function, a Daravan seemed to exert an effect. So, in the yellow here are the placebo and in the blue are the Adarava, and you can see there is a significant difference. And even the patients in this blue with a yellow dotted line, that is, they were on placebo in the original study and then moved to Adarava, uh, they actually eventually sort of um, 
you know, they didn't do as well as the people that were on the Davron uh, from the outset. So the, the key message of this study was that you probably should start a Davron from the uh, outset as it seems to exert, exert its uh, benefit early on. And if you delay it, then there could be critical time lost, which you can really never get back, even if you then put the patients on the, on the Daravan. So this was kind of a, a very uh, supportive and positive study. But unfortunately, uh, a Japanese group um, led by a whole bunch of authors, of which Albert Ludolf was a senior author, uh, looked at uh, the efficacy of a Daravan by measuring how quickly patients progress uh, through what's called the rate of disease progression. Uh, it's this is a measure that we use in trials. And they found no significant difference uh, between adaravone and controls, which is rather disappointing. And then they said, well, maybe we're selecting the wrong patients. So they looked at people whom the Japanese patients selected, you know, very early, minimal disease, and compared them to a group that was different to the Japanese group. And again, there was no uh, difference. So kind of the jury's a little bit out on a Daravone, and I think it would be important to get it approved in Australia so that we could uh, get our own uh, experience with this drug. So perhaps maybe it's something about the German patients that makes them resistant to a Daravone, I don't know. And again, this is just showing that there was no difference in survival between a Daravone and controls in their long-term trials. So that's the Daravan. Now, another drug that has been um, spoken about a lot is a drug called alnylam, or uh, it has a complex name called sodium phenylbutyrate toroursodiol, or TUDCA. Now, this drug was used for another condition called familial amyloid neuropathy. So it's a hereditary nerve disorder, and it seemed to have had a benefit. Uh, one of the mechanisms of action of this drug is to, again, also reduce the degree of stress within the cells, both the motor neuron, but also the upper motor neurons, and also improves mitochondrial function, that is, those little organelles that produce energy. And so uh, the Niels Consortium conducted uh, a 24-week uh, study where they gave patients either this to, um, alnylam, I'll call it, uh, together with placebo versus but together with Rilizol uh, and compared them to placebo versus Rilizol. And you can see here, there was a significant reduction in the rate of disease progression or functional decline in patients that were treated with this drug. And this uh, effect was significant. That was the primary endpoint. Um, now, there was also some benefit uh, when they measured the upper motor neuron, uh, the upper limb strength. So the arm strength seemed to have been better um, in uh, patients that received alnylam. That is, they didn't exhibit as fast a decline in muscle strength. But unfortunately, there were no uh, benefits in other measures, such as breathing function, uh, which uh, obviously David will talk about, uh, or uh, more importantly, a compound called neurofilament, which is a blood biomarker of nerve loss. Um, uh, but in their open label extension studies that were subsequently pu published, they found that alnylam uh, probably increases life expectancy by about six and a half months. Uh, and that effect uh, is independent of, of whether the patients were Rilizol, Adaran, or both. Remember, this was conducted in America, and they've got exposure to both drugs. Uh, and if you switch the patient who was in the, uh, the placebo group uh, to alnylam after the 24 weeks, uh, they um, uh, did not do as uh, well. So the, uh, the, the message, as with Adaravan, um, you probably should uh, uh, start these patients as soon as uh, possible uh, in the early stages of the disease process because that's where they seem to uh, exert most benefits. So they seem to be protecting the nerves from dying. So that, that, they're the sort of two oral drugs uh, and I'll talk about another one that we're involved with, which is quite exciting. But now I want to change, change topic to uh, genetic therapies. Now, this is important because of all the media that we had over the weekend. So uh, when we look at um, the genes, the first gene that was ever described in ALS is this SOD1 gene or superoxide dismutase. So this was described in the early 90s. And since then, a number of other genes have been described. 
uh, the most common of which in the uh, Caucasian population is the C9 off gene. And so these genes, we believe, um, uh, get mutated. And the way they cause disease is through a toxic gain of function. That is, the proteins they produce are harmful to the cell. Whereas uh, if the gene was not mutated, it would, not, uh, it would produce a protein that exerts some normal function. And this provides an opportunity to block the production uh, of uh, uh, the injurious material. And there are two ways, two major ways to do that. One way is to actually introduce a small bit of DNA called antisense oligonucleotide, which gets into the nucleus and binds to the earliest form of messenger RNA. So DNA gets copied to uh, immature uh, RNA, and then that gets to what's called the more mature RNA. Now, this immature RNA is in the nucleus. And so you can either block it there, or you can actually block it uh, in its mature stage. Uh, and uh, this can be either just a block where it binds to the um, a mutated mRNA and prevents it, uh, prevents the cell from producing the protein, which will damage the cell. Uh, and or you can actually, this antisense oligonucleotide can induce the breakdown of this harmful protein. And in actual fact, this is how the drug tofersin that I'm about to talk about works. So this acts against the superoxide dismutase one mutated mature messenger RNA. It binds to it and it actually breaks it down, so you get no protein production. And um, the Valor study, which was published uh, at the end of last year in the New England Journal, and the Westmead side of, when I was at Westmead when uh, we had this, we were the sole lead side in Australia. And unfortunately, despite all our efforts, we could not recruit anybody in Australia for this uh, study. And then COVID hit and we had to stop. But in essence, the way that this drug is given, this antisense oligonucleotide, is by a needle given into the lower back. 100 milligrams of the drug is given, and there are a number of doses. In total, eight doses are given uh, over a period of um, 28 weeks on roughly uh, a weekly basis. And then they did an open label extension study. So what are the results? So upon reading the study initially, the primary end result is negative. So the primary endpoint was this parameter called ALS-FRS, which is just a measure of health of functionality of a patient. Now, you can see uh, this is uh, placebo and this is tofersin. Uh, there was no significant difference. But then they looked at secondary endpoints. Uh, and what seemed like a seemingly negative trial had some uh, real interesting findings. First of all, that protein, that SOD1 protein, was significantly reduced in patients that were treated with the drug. And secondly, the um, neurofilament uh, uh, protein, which looks at nerve breakdown, was also significantly reduced, suggesting that there's less nerve breakdown in, in patients that receive tofersin. The other parameters were uh, negative at 28 weeks, breathing function, muscle strength, and so on. And then they uh, extended the study uh, and reported the findings for another uh, 24 weeks, up to 52 weeks. And you can see the, the, in the blue are the people on the sugar tablets initially, and then in the red are the people with tofersin. And if you switch the, pay, uh, uh, the sugar uh, people to tofersin, the SOD1 protein reduced and the neurofilament level reduced. And, and this, is the, this is why the FDA proved that there was a significant improvement uh, uh, in functional capacity, that is, there was less functional decline in those patients that had received the first one from the outset. There was better breathing in those patients that received the first one from the start of the trial compared to the ones that were switched uh, from placebo. And you can see even there's some perhaps improvement, although this could be just a measurement error. And muscle strength also seemed to uh, not decline, but uh, uh, whilst the decline in the first 28 weeks, from 28 to 52 weeks, it seemed to stabilize or even slightly improve. And this is the reason why the FDA approved it. So the authors were very honest. They said, look, there's no clinical benefits, but there are some really interesting findings in, this, uh, uh, in these uh, uh, open label studies that suggest perhaps that there may be some clinical benefits. And based on this, the FDA conditionally approved tofersin for use in 
a, a particular familiar form of ALS caused by the SOD1 mutation. It's about 1% of all ALS. And the ATLAS trial is currently underway, looking at carriers of this, uh, uh, of this gene. So people that are well, but just carrying the gene, and they want to see whether they can prevent the onset of ALS. So this is not for every single uh, ALS patient or most ALS patients. It's only for that small proportion that have a familial uh, form of ALS. Unfortunately, uh, the antisense oligonucleotide to the, the more common gene, C9 North, was uh, very negative. And this, these findings have not, you know, that they, they were announced, the drug was withdrawn, and I don't believe this has been published. Now, in the last sort of few minutes, I want to talk to you about something that I'm involved with, and this is quite an exciting uh, treatment. It's nanocrystalline gold. So this is given as an oral uh, liquid every day. And the way that this works is that it re-energizes the whole cell, increases it, increasing its energy production, reducing oxidative stress, and allowing the cell to remove uh, this harmful protein that damages the cell. And so we conducted a small phase to a 36-week trial called the Rescue ALS. And there's an open label extension, which is ongoing. Um, we recruited 45 patients across two centers, Brain and Mind Center and uh, Westmead slash Concord. And what we found was the primary endpoint was this neurophysiological measure called Munich. That tells you um, how much uh, uh, nerves uh, are lost using nerve studies. This is not a particularly good measure, but there was a trend to reduction in the decline in this uh, uh, measure. And if you did a subgroup analysis and looked at patients with limb onset disease, there was about a 45% decline in how quickly these nerves degenerated. It almost reached significance. Uh, uh, and you know the reason why the total cohort didn't uh, uh, receive better results is probably because a lot of people with bulbar onset or onset in their uh, speech and swallows that that you know don't really reflect. Munich doesn't really reflect uh, how fast they're progressing. But what was interesting is we added a couple of exploratory endpoints and lo and behold, we were surprised to find these findings. At 36 weeks, patients who had received uh, uh, the drug had a significantly slower rate of disease progression. And we defined that as time to either tracheostomy ventilation, gastrostomy tube, uh, or death. Uh, I mean, no one really gets tra tracheostomy, but it was really time to NIV gastrostomy or dying from motor neuron disease. So the disease was progressing at a much slower rate. And not only that, but the time it took for that uh, ALSFRS score, the functional score to decline by six points or more was significantly less in the CNMA group. And when we combined our open label extension and looked at probability of survival, the patients that were on the drug from the outset had a better survival than those that were initially on placebo. And this was statistically significant, although the numbers are re uh, relatively small at 120 weeks, but certainly at, at 96 weeks, they are significant. And interestingly, people that were on placebo and then switched onto the drug caught up. Uh, now, we are planning a larger phase three international study called Recovery ALS, uh, and we hope to get this launched off later this year or early next year. And, in the la and uh, one last thing that I want to mention uh, is this drug called methylcobalamin, that's just vitamin B12. There was a study conducted by the Japanese uh, investigators that looked at uh, ultra high dose uh, of methylcobalamin, sort of in, uh, intramuscular injections twice a week for a period of 16 weeks, short study, but there were some suggestions that this treatment can slow down the rate of disease progression uh, uh, compared to uh, placebo. And the way that works, is that it reduces glutamate exciter toxicity. Um, and again, this is just recap recapitulating what they found. Again, there is no significant difference on say breathing function or uh, muscle strength scores. Um, so obviously, you know, we've had a lot of failures and you know, the Valor study is primarily a negative study based on the primary endpoint, but there are some real green shoots of hope there. Uh, however, we must do better. And I, I think to do better, we must be more innovative. Normally, we just recruit patients and we give them a single drug and we assume everybody's the same. 
We are now moving away from this, whereby we're more streamlining patients into different groups based on how they present various molecular uh, phenotypes, genetic phenotypes, and then we're conducting multiple uh, 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 stage trials. We're giving them multiple drugs and uh, doing uh, uh, in parallel, and we're measuring the outcome at an early stage. So, if the, and we're using biomarkers that are perhaps not clinical, but rather uh, are engaging biomarkers, measures of nerve loss, such as neurofilament and perhaps maybe neurophysiology down the track. One such example is this lithium trial. Some years ago, a, about 10 years, or, uh, 10 years or so ago, a Japanese group suggested that lithium works in ALS. Uh, a subsequent uh, UK MND trial uh, run by a, a host of UK and uh, uh, American authors found absolutely no significant difference at you know, zero, three, up to 18 months um, on any of the measures, clinical measures. And this is what the survival looked like. There was absolutely no difference between controls and lithium. Now, but before they threw the drug out, they said, well, let's have a look at this a bit further. And so then they looked at their gene status. So patients that had a particular gene, UNC13A, NC9 North, did worse than those that didn't carry it. And when they gave lithium to both the C9 North and the um, UNC13A groups, what they found was that those patients that carried the UNC13A mutations did better than those that didn't have UNC13A. So perhaps people with an UNC13A mutation should not be included uh, or should be included in a trial and analyzed in a different way. And this is the basis of uh, the MAGNA trial that is um, uh, uh, that has started. We are obviously looking for volunteers, but they have to have this UNC13A uh, mutation. So I'd like to sort of stop there. And this is our team. Um, uh, Julie, a uh, right, our nurse, uh, Bronwyn as well, uh, Bronwyn Orden, who's uh, another uh, ALS, ALS nurse, is Linda McHale, who's our um, uh, the, uh, research director, and Vina Riker, who's our a rehabilitation specialist and Professor Menon, who's involved both in the Concord and also the St. Joseph's Clinic. So I also uh, work in or with the St. Joseph's Clinic and Julia Labra and Shay Morrison. So um, if uh, our emails are there and if you have any questions, please reach out to us. Thank you. And I'll now hand over um, to David uh, Berlewitz. Uh, thanks very much, Steve. Um, all right, so it's my turn to wrangle the screen sharing now. Um, please do let me know if that hasn't worked. Um, but it looks like we're in business. That is good. Thank you, David. Thanks, Gavin. Um, So we're going to switch tack slightly, still to controlled clinical trials. Um, just one, uh, a, it's about a physical intervention rather than a, 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 a therapeutic. So this is the um, free three-letter acronym study, which we're running at the moment, which is funded by the Medical Research Future Fund. Um, let's start with, you've seen a lot of um, uh, these survival curves already this evening. And what they show, for those of you who might not, might not be quite used to them just yet, is that this is the group, this, the proportion, we all start out with a, with a trial where 100% of the people in the trial are, um, uh, are, are in the trial. And over time, um, if the outcome is survival, for example, people die. And when you see daylight between these curves, especially if there's a magic p-value associated with it, you can tell if one of them is different to the other. This is from the one very small randomized controlled trial upon, upon which we based all of our treatments with non-invasive ventilation. And what it showed in 40, only 41 people, so kind of barely 20 in each group, was that giving people ventilation, so that picture on the page before, a mask to help you breathe overnight when your breathing gets weak overnight. As your breathing muscles decline with motor neuron disease, sleep is usually the first place where you see it because everybody breathes less when they're asleep. Um, 
That was the survival curve, which was statistically significantly different. And this is the quality of life uh, measure, the way in which they did it, which also has clear daylight from one group to the next. But one of the things that's really important about this study is that it was very small. And when you do very small studies, it's easy to get uh, chance results. Uh, statistics are measures of chance. Um, what we saw here in terms of overall survival benefit was about 6.8 months, which is, um, in this study, that's about double what you see in the result. But what we saw in people who were in this trial who had trouble with breathing and swallowing vulvar disease at the time of randomization, that's not necessarily how they presented, there was no value for them being in the study whatsoever. But arguably, that's because so many of them that were just randomly allocated and the study wasn't stratified for bulba or not. Um, uh, seven people, five people died within the first seven days. And so there was no opportunity for them to see any benefit. However, what this has done is close the door on a randomized control trial. There's clearly no clinical or ethical, what we call equipoise. There's no balance in the question. You can't ask this question again in this way. So what do we do? Because it's still not clear. So one of the ways we try and examine this is to do what a comprehensive cohort with or without an emulated trial within it. So these are data from Victoria. This is from our study of almost 20 years worth of people living with motor neurone disease. Um, uh, as you can see, and across all the phenotypes, all of the um, uh, all of the types of the ways that MND presents, overall, we got a survival advantage of 13 months, which is much larger than what you see with result between those people who could tolerate and those who don't. So it's the same kind of benefit that you see with the drug, where it slows the rate of progression. It's not a gene therapy that's transforming and abolishing the drug, but just like these there are these um, things that are on the PBS, this physical therapy does seem to make the same kind of changes. And there are four other international cohorts that show the same thing. These first three are smaller, a few hundred people, um, although this one is bigger. And more recently, uh, Jason Acrevo in uh, the University of Pennsylvania has published a really nice and very large study that's actually better done than everybody else, that suggests quite clearly that at least four hours a night worth of therapy is kind of the magic dose that makes a big difference. However, his data also shows that any use is worthwhile, even um, anything more than zero seems to produce some kind of benefit, though it's smaller, and that on average, there is a, not for the, every person who's using the machine, but on average, there is a dose response. The more you use it, the more benefit you get, at least in survival. We don't have such good data um, across all of these trials of our quality of life or patient experience. What we do have very good data about though, is that pretty much everybody's on Relizola, and not everybody is using NIV in Australia. So this is from the Australian population data. Um, we don't expect 100% of people to be able to use non-invasive ventilation. It's not the right choice for everybody. It's like lots of physical therapies. This is a complex decision that needs to be made with the whole team. But overseas uptake rates are much higher than this. They're up closer to sort of 40 to 50 to 60 percent of people living with, with motor neurone disease are using NIV. Now, there are some problems with these, this estimate. It might be a bit small, but we don't think it's terrible, like complete rubbish. So why is that? And so they've done some really nice work trying to unpack why it's so hard for many people to use NIV. Um, this is from a group in Sheffield who've done a lot of this work, a group of neurologists and respiratory people who work together. And there's really four phases where things get complicated. Well, it's always complicated realistically. Um, the first is in this decision to trial, and there are lots of factors that came out in this systematic review that mapped to difficulties. There's a lot of 
difficulty, different difficulties, different complexities in how you start people and how you keep them going. And then there's also complexities associated with end of life care and where non invasive ventilation sits in good palliative care and good care of the dying. Now, most of our research is in this phase. We are doing some work uh, actually at both ends of the scale, but the bulk of what we do is here. And what we're particularly, what I'm going to talk about tonight are studies that look at place, the settings, the machine, and how we set all this stuff up and get it going, and a bit about monitoring and adjustment. So this started, um, we've got a long history um, of doing this kind of research. Um, but this particular trial that I'm talking about tonight is based on Liam Hannon's work as a PhD student, where he did um, a single centre trial at the Austin, where he tested, so this is somebody getting set up on NIV um, by one of our physios, and the experiment tested just how well, I apologise for the noise, this is to prove I'm still at work, um, uh, the... This is where we tested the way in which you started non-invasive ventilation, whether that mattered. So in most parts of the world, our place included, we start by bringing somebody to clinic, or they might do it in their home, or they might do it in a hospital bed. There are lots of different ways of doing this, where we set somebody up during the day on non-invasive ventilation. And then usually we'll let people give it a bit of a go have a bit of a practice. Sometimes they'll stay overnight in the sleep lab, but usually um, that won't be for very long. So what Liam tested is whether if you bring somebody back and really try and get the machine and the person to be fully in sync, does that matter? And it turns out it did. What we found was that in that group where we really optimised the coordination and the um, efficacy of the of the titration where we paid a lot of attention to how well people slept and breathe and how good the control of their breathing was, we found that fewer people, so at when we first set up, first set it up, both groups were having about the same proportion of people who weren't getting over this magic four hours who were having trouble. But what we did find was in the control group where we just let them keep going, that only got worse. And in the group where we optimised the coordination of the device with a sleep study, which is a very um, comprehensive monitoring of somebody, we could make quite a big difference in, in terms of who was then able to use the machine overnight. So that's all well and good. Um, we have a statewide service here in Victoria. We see a lot of people with motor neurone disease and start them on their ventilators. So, of course, the risk was it might just be an Austin effect, and that's no use. If it's just something that relies on two or three really skilled physios, that doesn't scale. That's no use for the rest of the country or the world. So what we wanted to do and what we were funded to do was to test this across the country and to see if we could make it work. So our primary endpoint, all these trials have a primary endpoint, was the same thing. Were people able to use it for at least four hours a night? That's the proportion of people using it that way. The secondary outcomes are the things that we think matter along the way. Steve's talked about a lot of secondary outcomes in some of those, you know, at first base values seem to be um, equivocal studies, studies that don't find a difference between the group. So things like how well your blood gases are controlled, how well your breathing is, how strong it is, and things around patient reported outcomes, particularly around burden. Then there's some relationships um, between how we've actually done this that we're exploring, and we're doing some machine learning and AI work in this space. And then we've got a 12 month follow up to look at the, the longer term experience of people with using these devices. So as I said, it's an Australia-wide study. We're very lucky to have a lot of help from a lot of people. Um, and we're running in all of these sites apart from Macquarie. Um, um, it's just taking us a little time to get a private hospital over the line in terms of ethics and governance, um, and that's fine. There's no, we should actually have this resolved in the next couple of weeks. 
and then it went wrong. So we wrote the grant in 2019. Uh, it was submitted in, in 2020, um, and we got it awarded in between the first two Melbourne lockdowns. So we went, okay, that's not going to work. So we deferred starting the trial until February, which was just before lockdown number three of six. So the way the funding from the federal government works, you have to get on and do the experiment. They wouldn't really let us wait any longer. So we did all the building of the trial and we were able to start up here at the Austin in Melbourne and managed to get through and randomise the first person in 2022. But the consequence of all this is we're running behind schedule. So this dotted line was the magic dotted line that I wrote in the grant with all our collaborators. And this is what we're actually doing. Now, we believe there's a whole bunch of things in place that put us on the cusp of this line turning back upwards, but we've got a lot of work to do to catch up. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why I'm presenting here tonight is so that, um, so that we can raise awareness about this study in the community. So one of the things that it's important to reflect on when you do these trials is that trials of clinical care, not unsurprisingly, require the clinical care to be known. COVID changed how we look after people in ho from the hospital an awful lot. Telehealth is common. You can still, uh, you know, you can talk to your doctor on the phone. It, you know, the script will magically appear. You can have video consultations. And quite rightly, during the pandemic, we were we didn't want people to come to, you know, people with respiratory compromise to come to where the sick people were. And neither did very sensible people living with weak muscles want to come into hospital. And so clinical services adapted and changed. And um, just like Dorothy said to Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore. This ain't how it used to be. So a lot of things have changed. And so we've adapted the trial and are working forward. But one of the things that has turned out to be really, really important, not just for our study, but also I think for really informing motor neurone disease care across the country, is that we're very lucky that one of our our postdoctoral research is an implementation scientist. So Steve touched on this a little bit. One of the things you do when you get a study that doesn't quite work out like you, you thought it might is you try and understand why. And this thing called implementation science in the last couple of decades has come along to really support us as clinical researchers to understand why it doesn't work quite the way we thought it was going to. And of course, to be then able to inform government, health, um, um, health departments, um, hospital administrators, other clinicians and people living with motor neurone disease. So there is a framework we're using called which has the acronym REAIN, which looks at, I'm not going to go through all these in detail, but looks at participation rates, how well we're reaching into the community. And what I'm doing tonight is part of that intervention. We look at the trial data. So we incorporate the effect, the, the, the did this group do better than that group kind of testing. The outcomes. But we also look very carefully at adoption. You know, particularly for physical therapy trials like this, did people get the therapy as we wanted them to get the, the, the um, therapy? What were the enablers and barriers to uptake? So this is qualitative data that we ask of the clinicians, but we also really importantly ask this of the people living with motor neurone disease as they come out the end of the trial. It's only a relatively short trial. It's, it's 11, 12 weeks, a bit of variation. We look at how well we did the implementation. And then thinking forward, we, we, we talk to clinicians towards the end of the study and say, well, if this worked, what would it take for you to incorporate it into clinical practice? So we've commenced the interviews with patients and carers about the um, uh, uh, about their clinical experience of non-invasive ventilation and of the research study. And so we'll be a, collating those data and we'll actually have that information before any of the results of the randomized controlled trial. 
And the other really important um, uh, element to this implementation science is actually what do the clinicians do? No two clinicians behave exactly the same way. They're as human as the rest of us. Um, and we're all a little bit different. We all read the same science and we all treat a different person in front of us. And we all try and adapt the science and our experience to provide best possible care for every person we do. We do see. But clinical practice guidelines support us here, but there's also a whole bunch of well-described um, behavioral domains that can be used to explore what influences healthcare practitioners' behaviors. And of the six of the seven sites, we've done all the baseline interviews. And again, um, through some funding from MNDRA that Marty Greco, one of our postdocs has received, will actually be extending this across the whole of the country to gain information, not just in our trial sites, but in every site about how people think and do the business of looking after people with motor neurone disease. So I'm gonna stop there um, and again, encourage people to talk to their team about NIV. Um, this is our team. We work across the School of Health Science at the University of Melbourne, the Institute for Breathing and Sleep, and the clinical service that does a lot of NIV. And we're very lucky to have been able to be supported. These were all the trials we're running at the moment across, across our group. And this was the one I talked about. Thanks very much, folks. Thank you both for uh, an awesome overview of uh, treatments and care, sort of current and future. So um, got a few questions lined up. Um, first, uh, a bit of a, a, a comment or a question uh, from Paula Howell at MND Vic. Many of the people online here may know Paula already. So she runs uh, the education sessions for newly diagnosed people. They include information about NIV. And uh, she's just wondering what key messages would you include, uh, would you like them to include to help encourage people to consider NIV when uh, their breathing function declines? Um, thanks, Gethin, and thank you, Paula. And you've kind of answered the question for me, I've got to say, in the last sentence. I mean, it's about a conversation. It's about um, making sure that when you do go and talk to your team, um, and for most people, it's not one team. There's a whole bunch of people who you interact with to get your MND care. Um, the important thing, I think, from a person living with MND perspective is to ask the question, is to just ask, just like, Peg, just like um, a whole bunch of other um, clinical trials that you might be eligible to participate in, you know, is to ask the question about are there, um, is MND likely, is, sorry, is non invasive, too many acronyms, is non invasive ventilation likely to be something that I need to consider? When am I going to consider it? Um, uh, how do we access it? What do I, all those kind of things. It's just part of the conversation. So the key message, the key message from my perspective is don't wait to be asked. This is just like any other treatment you're going to use to help you live with motor neurone disease. And so just like when do I start Rulizol, it's when do I consider starting NIV, I think. Thank you, David. Um, uh, uh, Steve, you mentioned in your um, your talk about a couple of sort of genetic targeting therapies such as the lithium and the uh, SOD1. Well, lithium doesn't target, but uh, people with uh, certain mutations. Um, how do uh, patients uh, find out their genetic status? What's the best way to do that to find out whether they carry the UNC13A or they carry SOD1? And is there ways to do that without having to go and pay for it yourself? Yeah, that's a very good question. <clears throat> uh, the short answer is yes, there are. Um, the SOD1 and the UNC13A, uh, they are what we call point mutations or little sort of spelling errors in your DNA. 
and um, next generation sequencing, which looks at a whole bunch of these genetic mutations, uh, became available on Medicare last year. So um, definitely it can be done um, uh, for free, well, not for free, but uh, under Medicare uh, charges, and we're doing more and more of that now. The commonest mutation, which is a C9 off, uh, that's a different type of mutation. It's an expansion in a particular gene that can't be picked up by this next generation sequencing. And so there is a, a small cost to that. I think through Concord Hospital, they charge uh, the molecular genetics department charges about three to four hundred dollars for the test. Um, as I said, the SOD1 potentially could be something that could have therapeutic uh, relevance, depending on uh, what uh, evolves with this uh, uh, trial. Um, the C9 North at this stage, it's still very much a, a management aspect in the sense that, you know, if you know you've got the gene, then there's genetic counseling, you try and prevent passing it on to offspring if you don't have them, et cetera. Um, there is no effective treatment, although I should uh, state for uh, C9-ORF, there is, a, uh, there is a, a genetic trial that's run, that's uh, being run uh, concurrently by a different company, and we don't have the results for that. The young 13 a again, that's part of the lithium trial, and you probably, if you want to enter that trial, you need to be tested for this gene. Thank you. Um... Uh, another question around NIV. Um, is introducing NIV early in the disease before having any true breathing issues for night sleeping, does that have any benefit? Is there a, a, any, any start too early as such? Or? Again, a really, really good question. I think um, uh, one of the studies that's never been done, um, because it would take literally thousands of people, um, is to really understand where exactly is the sweet spot for starting NIV. It's a really tricky clinical question. Um, we, we do know that there is a sweet spot. We know clinically that if you start people too early, um, they, they feel no benefit. And so like it's not the simplest of things. You have to get this thing on your face. And for people who live with uh, sleep apnea and 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 stuff uh, and use CPAP for sleep apnea, they will tell you that the right time to start it is when you feel better the morning after you used it. But at the moment, that's actually the best test for responsiveness we've got. You need to get a benefit from using any physical therapy to do it again. You don't go running or for a big long bike ride just for the pain in your muscles. You go because you feel better afterwards fundamentally. There has to be some payoff to continue to choose these therapies every night. So it's really not uncommon and, and there are logistic and complexity issues. Say you live in the country and you really need to have a peg inserted because you're having trouble with, um, with your feeding and you really want to do this. But it's really, really difficult for your carer, your, your family member to take time off and to come down from Wagga and to be in Sydney for a couple of days to get all this stuff to, to support you to have this stuff done. It's not uncommon for people to who are also thinking that they want to start NIV to try and combine those two things at the same time. Like on face value, it makes a lot of sense. And sometimes that really is the best choice, but it might mean that you might be starting the NIV too early or the peak too early or both of, one of them a little bit late or it might be perfect. So this timing question is really, really, really tricky. There is a, there is a right time probably for pretty much everybody to start it, but we can't tell you necessarily exactly when that's going to be. And so that's why, to come back to Paula's question, it's about having conversations with the people who are helping you through the journey. It's about having sensible conversations about what your symptoms are now, what you expect from them to help you with that, how you'll be able to know that it's got better. Um, it's good clinical care. That's the, still the cornerstone of how we make the lives with, of, of people living with motor neurone disease the best it can be. So it's really, really good question. Really, really hopeless answer, I'm afraid, in terms of precision. 
But that's because it is very, very, very difficult to, to say in one person or another. There are criteria, and to be perfectly honest, almost all the published criteria, particularly the American ones, are too late. Um, they, they're, they're actually about funding criteria, not about person benefit. So yeah, it's tricky. It's a very tricky issue. Um, so, so Steve, you were talking about uh, the idea of personalised medicine coming through and using perhaps a cocktail of, of treatments. Is there any data already about people combining Riliazole and Edaravone? I mean, they're the two that have been around for a long time. Do you know if there's evidence that because they, in theory, address two different systems, would they work well together or complement each other? Yeah, look, that's a very good question. I mean, I presented some of those, a couple of those uh, uh, trials, one by the American group, and there are others. The, the Japanese have also published them. Certainly, um, uh, some studies or a number of studies clearly indicate a benefit in terms of survival. Um, uh, again, there's no improvement in muscle strength uh, or a reversal of functional disability, but there's certainly a slowing of rate of disease progression when you compare it to a control group. And that's, um, you know, uh, some may say, well, you know, that's not a cure. That doesn't stop the disease and doesn't reverse it. And, uh, you know, but that's that's factual. But if you look at Adara and Rizal, they, they, you know, there have been some conflicting studies on that. You know, the German, the large German trial found no benefit. So my feeling is given that ALS has, you know, multiple uh, processes um, that are acting and that evolve at a particular point in time, I think what we have to do is go back to the bench and identify these um, triggers. Uh, I call them, you know, degenerative or death triggers. There is something to say to the cell at a particular time in one's life, go, don't stop, keep degenerating. And I think we got to find, like with the NIV, we got to find that sweet spot, that, that time where you actually have to implement an effective medication that acts against uh, the, the critical process that triggers everything uh, uh, off. Clearly, there is a buildup of factors, whether that be, I don't know, playing rugby or, uh, or that sport they play down in Victoria or playing soccer or being in the, you know, the American Marines and being a Finnish skier and so on. Uh, there are all of these environmental factors and there are genetic predispositions. But in my mind, uh, there is probably um, a factor uh, that is a critical factor or, or a related set of critical factors to trigger the disease. And the reason why we don't have an effective treatment, uh, we have treatments that can slow down the disease progression, but the reason why I feel we don't have an effective treatment is we, we don't understand the pathophysiology all that well, or completely as, or as completely as we should to develop an effective treatment. So that sounds like a... A good encouragement to keep funding the basic research as well as the uh, the clinical research as well. Well, I think what has to happen, there has to be a symbiosis between clinical and molecular. You know, we're finding that in hereditary neuropathies, uh, the, the, the genetic uh, diagnostic tests, you know, the high powers in the genetic tests have given us um, lots of information. I think you re what you really need to have is centers of excellence where you combine clinicians and um, and different uh, ilks of molecular um, uh, people, yeah, cellular people, functional people, um, proteomic people, uh, together with you know bioinformatics people. I mean, that's in essence what you need. Yeah. Um, so this is a question probably for both of you a bit. So um, we've. You talked about NFL or NFH as being um, the neurofilament markers, potential being biomarkers. So do you see these being the, the first step towards really getting that a better diagnostic mark of the disease? And perhaps for David as well is, how does the um, NIV, does that affect NFL at all? So 
I have a question to both of you. Um, David, do you want to go first? And, yeah, uh, sure. I'll go, I'll go first. So we don't. So one of the best ways to produce intracellular oxidative stress is to wake up from an apneic event. So when you have a sleep disordered breathing event, your oxygen level drops spectacularly. And we know that when you arouse from sleep, even if it's not to full arousal and you resume breathing, oxygen floods back into your cells and produces a large amount of redox stress. We know that NIV, uh, sorry, that motor neurone disease, at least in some of the putative pathways and experiments, is associated with intracellular oxidative stress. We've got some very tiny um, preclinical amounts of data suggesting that if you model um, sort of chronic intermittent hypoxia, sleep disordered breathing, you can make um, motor neurone disease uh, animal models, SOD1 models, um, uh, die faster. So there is some small amount of sort of bed back to bench to uh, kind of reason to believe that NIV is kind of disease modifying in as much as it might take away this chronic intermittent hypoxia. And indeed, you know, the, the, the newer medications um, that target intracellular oxidative, you know, the target oxidative stress may well have a, um, an additive or a multiplicative effect with NIV. We don't know. We've not done these experiments yet, but it, it has biological plausibility, I think it's fair to say. So, so I think the idea that a biomarker is a compound is just rubbish. If, you know, personalised medicine is not going to give us one magic thing that we count that tells us about disease onset. I think Steve's comment about bioinformatics is really important because all of these environmental, um, you know, exacerbating factors, but also um, potentially environmental modifying once the disease is present factors need to be incorporated into these bioinformatics platforms and us really take advantage of these big data that we're starting to accrue. Um, I'm just going to put in one plug for the MindOz you know, registry here, because this is our pathway in the country through to gathering that information. It's never going to happen at one clinic or another, or even one centre of excellence, I don't think. It's actually going to require the entire country pulling together and people with lived experience putting in their own data um, so that we get the full picture about what a person has, is, does, and then we can do our personalised medicine. No, absolutely. And by a centre of excellence, I was indirectly referring to MindOz, which is a national centre of excellence. And I agree, I think we need this uh, big data uh, stuff. Now, in terms of diagnosis, I mean, the, 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 the best diagnosis is a clinical one, which is not the most optimal, supported by excluding other conditions and um, using various tools such as neurophysiological tools that I use and, um, uh, and you know, other tools to sort of support the diagnosis. Neurofilament, unfortunately, is not a very good diagnostic measure because it is seen in other conditions. Um, it seems to be a, a reasonably good measure of nerve loss, which is, you know, uh, not specific to ALS, but uh, if taken in the appropriate context, uh, it, it, it is. Uh, I mean, part of the issue is that, uh, is that the trials themselves, the way we design these trials, you know, we exclude a lot of people. Yeah, people with respiratory dysfunction are excluded. If your uh, breathing function is bad, you don't get included into the trial. Uh, but I, I think taking a step back, I think combining the clinical with other um, disciplines, molecular, genetic, bioinformatics, as I said, in a national center of excellence like the MindOz. And I think the MindOz is probably one of the best things that has happened uh, for ALS research over the last, you know, day dot, so to speak. Uh, I think that will significantly enhance understanding of, uh, of ALS. The other thing is, I think it's very important to just be wary of these sensational claims that, you know, one sees on Channel 9 or Channel 10 or whatever. Um, 
about magic bullets and and all of this. Uh, you know, I think you really have to interpret the data in cold, you know, in a cold hard light and, and be very critical um, of the trial, but look to find positives in every trial like this Valor. So whether whether the gene genetic uh, trials will be a success or not, I don't know. I mean, one of the things that really con a bit concerns me, I mean, I, the other hat that I wear is I look after another very rare condition, much rarer than motor neuron disease, called um, amyloid neuropathy or translyretin amyloid neuropathy, which is a mutated protein. Now, if you give these patients um, one of these uh, genetic therapies, I mean, you're talking about a remarkable effect. Their nerve, their neuropathy, their nerve function improves. It gets better. Um, and so that's because we, we kind of, it's a simpler disease and we kind of understand there's one point, there's a mutation, and from that we start. ALS is a lot more complicated than that. Thank you, Steve. Yes. Um, yeah, that, uh, that magic marker as such is, yeah, uh, it's, it's not going to happen, I don't think. Um, we've got a couple of other quick questions on, online as well, just to finish up with, because we're running a bit over time. Um, has hyperbaric oxygen therapy been considered in MND? I don't know, David, if you've got any thoughts on that, or Steve, maybe. I'll leave it to David. You've got a quick answer. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Um, uh, when we, what we do have evidence, the, the short answer is I don't know. Um, uh, not in the context of respiratory disorders, because it's not a problem of low oxygen. It's a problem of weak muscles that don't move your chest enough. And the consequence of that is low oxygen and high carbon dioxide. So when we actually put somebody on non-invasive ventilation, we're not trying to make them breathe more. Generally, all we're trying to do is stop them breathing less when they go to sleep. So when we set up the machines, what we're aiming for, the sweet spot, I keep coming back to this, that we're aiming for, is actually to completely bottle their breathing while they're resting, while somebody's resting quietly on a bed, and then give them support to do exactly that while they go off to sleep. When you do this well, when you're setting somebody up on non-invasive ventilation, you've got them sitting in a quiet room, you've worked out the mask, you've got a bit of an idea what their upper airway is doing and stuff, and you just kind of yeah, you know, most people have got normal lungs. They're, they're not hard to ventilate. You're just giving them a little whisk or more. And if you've done it right, somebody goes straight up to sleep because they're really tired. But every other time they've tried to go off to sleep, they just start to fall in and then they're awake again. And that's why you get sleepy during the day. So we don't actually need additional oxygen. And in some ways, too much oxygen uh, is potentially bad because of the oxidative stress. So um, what we're aiming to do is give per people the right amount of oxygen, the same amount they need during the day. Just stop the reduction in brain activity that happens to us all when we go off to sleep, making them fall off the cliff. Thank you, David. Great answer. Uh, uh, question here, probably more for Steve. So any thoughts on neuron or ebidula? Ebidulast, I think that was uh, a trial. Ebidulast, yeah. Uh, neuron, that's the uh, stem cell, and ebidulast yeah, is the mast yeah. cell thing. Look, I mean the the, the um, um, neuron uses mesenchymal stem cells. Uh, there have been some studies that have been published which are, uh, in essence, negative. It's hard to see how mesenchymal stem cells can. Um, you know, re regenerate or replenish nerves because that's the idea of it. Eduloblast acts against the uh, the inflammatory system. I mean, there's a big movement to look at inflammatory agents in uh, ALS, and lots of research has been uh, done in that. Um, invariably, the studies have been negative, including the one that we did on a drug called Tecfidera, which increases what well what we uh, meant to increase regulatory t cells which were thought which were hopefully uh, meant to sort of reduce the rate of disease progression that was a negative study um i don't think that eduloblast will be sort of um the uh, the panacea or the um the treatment mesetinib is another one that they've trialed that's a direct 
microglia agent. It's like it's used in various hematological conditions. Um, and there were some very soft positive findings. They are doing a large phase three study, but it's hard to see how this could be regenerative. I mean, this is not MS. This is not an primarily an inflammatory disorder. This is primarily a neurodegenerative disorder with secondary inflammation. But, you know, I'm happy to look at everything. <laughs> yeah, again, it may be... Uh... Those drugs may work well in combination with other drugs that can perhaps, yeah. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and the last final question, uh, I'll promise now, this is um, maybe just a quick yes or no, maybe a might be a good plug for NIV is, did Stephen Hawking use NIV? If you know. He, he used both NIV and then IV. So he used... Um, uh, ventilatory support through a mask, um, but actually not for all that long from what I understand, sort of relative to the period um, that he lived. Uh, he did use um, he did use tracheostomy ventilation when he was in his um, in his chair. It's one of the reasons why he used a, 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 an assistive voice device is because he bypassed his his uh, voice box. Right. Well, we're, we're well over time, so um, I'll, I'll let you guys go and have your, your dinner and everyone else too. So thank you again. That was a fabulous um, run through all the, a lot of the treatment options available to us. And I hope it's um, giving people some real insights and some hope for the future. We're definitely moving in the right direction. I think it's amazing the changes, even the last couple of years, I think. Um, for those watching tonight, everyone rec will receive a link to a recording. Um, please feel free to distribute that across your networks so more people can appreciate this, uh, these fantastic insights. And also, um, this will be loaded up on our website, on our uh, YouTube page. Um, uh, there's also our monthly up research updates, research directions, so keep an eye out for them. And I think that'll be it for tonight. Um, so thank you again, David and Steve. And thank you, everyone who dialed in, and um, good night. Good night. Thank you. Bye, all.